started. Uh, good afternoon and good morning and to all the different time zones, hello. Uh, my name is Alan Clegg, as Vicki mentioned, and uh, today is October 30th of 2019. It's the day before Halloween here in the U.S., celebrated as a wonderful holiday where we get to give away candy. It's, I think, uh, sponsored by the Dentists Association. Anyway, the uh, topic today is bind logging, um, and, and I kind of uh, subtitled this as content out of chaos. Um, there's so much in logging um, in basically all of the things that we do on computers that, that often we get distracted by things that we shouldn't and uh, sometimes miss things that we should. So what I'm going to do today is, is attempt to help with uh, bind how to go about uh, getting logs that are both useful um, and, and yet you know, they're not overwhelming. So you're able to find what you need with as little trouble as possible. So first thing, let's think about a little bit, why do we do logging? And the, uh, the primary reason that we do logging, um, well, first of all, anytime we get something new, if we have a new toy, we always, always uh, turn on the logging to make sure that it's working correctly, make sure that there's uh, information out there uh, as to you know, what it's doing, make sure that uh, it's responding as it should, and make sure it's not responding to people that it shouldn't. So we you know, set it up to log for a general overview of the functionality of, of the device or of the system. And at that point, we very often just start to ignore it. Well, at that point, you know, we'll, we'll set up a, a filter in our email or in our, our logging application, and uh, it'll just send the, uh, the logs to some place that uh, you know, maybe is useful, maybe we can find it, maybe we just trash it immediately. The problem becomes the next time that we need to look at the logs, and that is when a service is broken or the network is on fire. You know, something's going wrong, something's going horrifically wrong, and we need to go back and find those logs. We need to look at those logs. We need to look in very strong detail. And unfortunately, you know, we're usually not tooled to do that. So when the network is broken or on fire, you're looking for specific logs related to a specific topic. You don't want these generalized logs that you were generating earlier. You want something that's very clear, very specific about the thing that is broken. And usually you want it in a higher detail than you normally get it. Uh, you know, it's bad enough that you're, you know, you're generating these thousands and thousands of log messages every day, but now you need to see the specific ones and you want even more than those thousands. So during normal operation, um, logging is mostly disregarded because we are trying to minimize disk space. Uh, we're trying to minimize the processing that the application or system uh, is, is using, uh, doing the, uh, the processing of the logs. And in addition, our attention span is, is really short because there's usually, you know, things that we need to look at that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, on fire or broken. And so the, the general logging is just kind of ignored. Um, logging, again, is very, very important during those network on fire events. And what we really want is lots of outputs specifically surrounding the bits that are causing problems. And we still want to have minimal processing. We don't want to log everything. We want to log the specific bits that we you know, are, are having issues with. And we usually want to do that without changing the configuration um, as much as possible. Um, uh, many times I've seen a system running where it's generating you know, an, a problem. There's something wrong with the way it's configured. Um, if you go in and you change the logging, Unfortunately, you have to restart the system or in some way modify the system in such a way that the problem suddenly goes away and it's no longer there until it happens again. And, you know, if you leave the logging in place, you're, you're generating lots and lots of logs that nobody's really interested in. And then, um, you know, you, you end up with a system where you're kind of bouncing back and forth between debugging it and it running slower or running it in normal production and then not being able to catch the information that uh, you need when it actually happens. So in BIND, uh, BIND is a little bit different from, uh, from many uh, uh, pieces of software in the way that it goes about doing logging. So there are two basic constructs in BIND that we need to worry about when we're talking about the logging facilities. 
And those two things are the categories and channels. So the categories are predefined by the bind engineers, by the people here at ISC that have intimate knowledge of the code. And those categories are basically defined as collections of messages around a common theme. And we'll see these themes on an upcoming slide. It's like, you know, DNSSEC. That's a, a pretty generalized theme. And messages related to DNSSEC are within a common category of DNSSEC. Uh, things about the database are in a database category. Uh, client processing is in a client category. Again, we'll see all of this in a little bit. You as a system administrator are not able to generate, create your own categories, but you, what you are able to do is put those categories into the places that you want them logged, which are the channels. So the channels are for the most part administrator defined. So you're going to go in and create these uh, channels into which the categories are, are funneled. So these channel definitions that you're going to create provide the location, so somewhere in the file system, the content, which of the categories, the detail level, you know, do we want debugging information or do we only want critical error messages, and the size of the output, you know, do we want to keep this logged forever or do we want to only keep the last, you know, 100 meg or 5 meg of the logging. Now, one of the interesting things about the detail level is it may be dynamic. And this is something that's really nifty because you're able to go in and create these channels and have them ready and on standby, but not necessarily logging the high level debug information that you're going to want during an event. And then when the event occurs, you just bump up the, uh, the logging, the debug level uh, by using the RNDC uh, trace command. And by doing that, you're able to turn on additional logging when the event is occurring without actually going in and modifying any of your configuration. That is an absolutely spectacular uh, functionality. And I don't think it's used as much as it probably should be. So I said that there were categories and here are the categories. And yes, it is such a wonderful list. Uh, we have clients, we have C names, we have blah, blah, and blah, blah, and this and that and the other. And most likely, if you're looking at an event and you're like, well, you know, we're not getting zones transferred correctly. Well, then you might want to think about looking at notify because that's one of the mechanisms that's used to say when a zone transfer should occur. You see that we have an X for in and X for out to actually look at specific zone transfers. And those might be the things that you would be interested in based on, you know, the event that you're, you're looking at. So go in and, and think about the event and look at these. Um, I'll give you a link a little bit later of where you can go in and find all of these and the definitions of them and what's actually logged into them. And I've highlighted two of them because these are, these are usually the most confusing to people. And that is default and general. Um, all of these, by the way, are uh, defined in the BIND Administrator's Reference Manual, which is in a PDF and HTML format uh, every time you download uh, the, the BIND source code. And it's very easy to find online at uh, isc.org on our website. So again, the two that, that people find confusing are the ones that I have highlighted here, which are default and general. So Think, people think that, oh, general, that's where, you know, stuff just gets put. Well, unfortunately, general is, yeah, it's where stuff gets put, but it's where stuff gets put that really doesn't fall into any other category that's listed on the screen here. So if you have something that is, for example, about views, and uh, it's an un, it's, it's, you know, you're falling through a view and you're not, you're concerned as to why a client isn't getting uh, matched you know, why it isn't working correctly. Well, you'll notice over there on the right-hand column, there's an unmatched category. The information is only going to show up in that unmatched category, not the general category. General does have a bunch of things in it, but it's usually just the, uh, the, the single one-off uh, debugging pieces of information that uh, the engineers needed at a time that didn't really fit into any other category. Now, the more interesting is default. And default is 
a category that is actually a combination of all of the other categories on the screen with the exception of queries. So if you want to turn on logging for basically everything and send it to one output, then you're going to want to take the default category and send it into a channel to make it go somewhere. So in this, this way, uh, you're actually going to be able to um, basically set up a very simple logging structure so that you're able to send all of the messages somewhere without necessarily knowing what specific category, whatever it is you're looking for is in. So you're able to go in, change the default category to go to a file. Then you're able to go and search through that file and find you know, anything from any of these categories. And again, with the exception of queries, you do not uh, get the logging of queries in the default category because it's just so huge. The amount of information that's logged into the queries category is basically, it's, it's turned off by default and it does not go into the default category. So with this list of categories, you can see that we can get very specific um, on some of the newer features of Bind. So for example, serve stale, um, RPZ, uh, the trust anchor telemetry. So you can see uh, queries that are being done based on uh, the trust anchors that are in place. So a lot of these are, are very useful. Some of them are, are really only going to be used by the uh, ISC engineers, for example, the database. Um, and we'll see a little bit later uh, some of the things that you can actually do that will break your logging um, if you have things that are running through and doing uh, pattern matches on logging. So be aware that if, if you don't see, if you see something on here that you're not really interested in, you don't necessarily need to log it anywhere. So the channels. Channels are, again, where each of those categories is sent. You as the administrator are able to say, well, I have this category and I want to send it somewhere where I can find it. I want to put it into a log file and maybe you want to combine it with another category. So you can send one or more categories into a single channel and you can also take a single uh, uh, category and send it to multiple channels. So you're able to both combine and split the channels or the categories among different channels. So there are four that are predefined. There are four channels that are predefined by all instances of bind. And then there is a fifth one that is created if you start bind with the uh, dash uppercase L option. So the ones that are created by default are default underscore syslog, which is where all of the logging goes before the namedy.conf is actually parsed to be able to figure out where logging should go. Default underscore debug, which is a file that is stored on disk. Um, and this channel is only turned on if the debugging level is above zero. Default standard error is, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Unix shell, it's the standard error output of the uh, running process. Now this sounds kind of useful, uh, except for the fact that under normal circumstances, all of the file descriptors, uh, standard out, standard error, uh, and standard input are disassociated from the NAMD process, um, basically at startup. So unless you're running with an option that specifically tells it not to disassociate from the terminal, default standard error is not very useful. The null channel is created, and that is relatively obviously where things are sent if you don't want them to be seen. So if you have something that is being logged and it, you, for example, you have something in the default channel or you're you know, seeing something and you really don't want it to be logged, you can send it to the null channel and it will just go away. So if you're, for example, uh, st uh, uh, lame servers. Lame servers is something that maybe you can deal with, but a lot of times it's just out of your control. It's easier just to log that to null than it is to worry with parsing it out and getting you know, something done with it or nothing done with it. Other channels you as the administrator are going to create, and I'll go into this in, in gory detail. Ah, it's Halloween, gory detail, uh, in the next following slides. Um, again, by default and before the parsing of namedy.conf, all of the system logging goes to the default underscore syslog. Now, I mentioned default underscore log file. 
That one is created if bind is started with a dash uppercase L, and then the additional option that's given with dash L is the file on disk into which this default underscore log file should be sent. So this allows you to create a log file kind of on the fly if you're doing debugging or, or whatever. So you can use default underscore log file, but only if you use this dash L option. I've never in actual uh, production seen this being used. Um, if you do, you know, please feel free to, to send me an email or, or send me a, a chat. I'm really interested. I'm curious as to, you know, how other people are using this, if it's actually something that is in use. So here is a direct uh, copy and paste out of the bind nine administrators reference manual. And this is one of the newer uh, reference manuals because it actually had uh, some options in here that I've never used. Um, and I will um, hesitatingly say that I didn't even know existed, and, but they're really kind of nifty. Um, in the, so in, this is a logging stanza. It is put into your namedy.conf. It is at the top level of the namedy.conf. It is not inside any other stanza, which means that when you turn on logging, you are doing it for your entire server, for all of the zones and for all of the views that are con contained and are served by this instance of bind. Um, I have actually opened a, a GitLab issue today making a recommendation that it might be useful to be able to do this on a per view basis. So if you're using views, it would kind of be nice to be able to do logging, you know, a different view is logged to a different set of uh, set of channels. Um, so, but we'll, we'll see, you know, how that goes. So in the, the logging stanza, uh, first of all, you're going to be able to say the categories and this category and the string there is the name of a category. Uh, the, the first string. The second string, the one inside the braces, is the name of a channel. So I have lots of examples, or several examples, not a lot, but several examples following this, which will make this a little bit clearer. But in this case, you're going to say category, the name of category, the open brace, the name of the channel to which you want it sent, a semicolon, any additional channels that you want it sent to, in case you want it sent to more than one, then a close brace and a semicolon to close off the category. So that allows you to send a category to a channel. The next blob is a channel configuration. The channel configuration allows you as the administrator to either modify the existing channels or to define your own. So in this case, you're going to have the word channel and then a string as the channel name that you were either modifying or creating an open brace, and then the following options that are all defining that channel. So this is something that's new, is the buffered option. And the buffered option says that uh, it's, it's obviously it's a Boolean, so it's either true or false. And this says, are we going to buffer this output or are we going to actually have it required to be written to disk before we, or written before we um, are allowed to continue? Are we going to, you know, are we going to block, blob it out as a, a larger blob of data being sent to the log file, or are we going to send it as individual messages? So um, I actually, I will admit it, admit that I do not know, and I can't look right now. Um, I believe that buffered is true. But again, I'm sure that somebody, uh, if somebody is uh, out there at a console where they can actually look at this, check it out, uh, look at the buffered uh, channel setting and see uh, how that uh, defaults. Moving on, we see the file, and then it takes a quoted string, and the file uh, statement here defines where on disk the data in this channel is going to be written. So in this case, you could do a double quote, uh, slash var, slash log, slash query dot log, close quote. This is going to write the data out to the specific file. If you have a directory statement in your global options and you do not start this file of the quoted string here with a slash, then it's going to be put into the directory structure below the directory option as you specified in the, uh, in the global config. Um, remember that if you are running change root, 
this is going, this file is going to be created in the change rooted directory structure, not in the directory structure of the main operating system. So if you have both a directory statement and you're running change root, remember that you change root first, then you add the directory, then you look for where the file is actually put in that structure. The uh, next couple of things here are parts of the file statement. Uh, we have a versions statement and versions says how many additional copies of this log file should we keep around? And in this case, uh, we actually have, it's going to be the word versions. And then we have a choice of unlimited or an integer. So if you say versions five, it's going to create version. It's going to keep the current log file plus the log file dot zero dot one dot two as many as you have this integer version set to. So if you have versions two, you're going to keep the version zero and version one. If you have versions three, zero, one, and two, and I think you get the picture on that. Now versions is used in addition to the next option, which is size. Size takes a, uh, a, a size, for example, one M for one meg or 100K for uh, uh, 100 kilobits, kilobytes, bleh. and what this is going to do is it's going to work with the version statement and say that when the currently outputted file reaches this size, we're going to create a new output file. So at that point, it's going to create a quoted string, whatever that quoted string name is, dot zero, and it's going to contain the current version of the file all of the other ones are going to be bumped up a version and the top most, if you have reached already reached your versions limit is going to be discarded. Um, and then something that is new that I, again, am, am not, I was not aware of because I obviously I just don't keep track of bind as closely as I should. We're actually able to add the suffix and the suffix is either increment, which is going to provide the dot zero dot one dot two or suffix of timestamp and that's actually going to create the log file with a the uh, extension being the time of day that was uh, at which the log file was rotated. So one thing that you need to be careful of is if you specify a file and you specify a versions number but do not specify a size, what that's going to do is every time you restart bind and that's not reconfig, that's actually restarting bind, it's going to take the existing log file, bump it up and start a new one. So it's not, it's gonna basically while bind is running, it's gonna continually generate a larger and larger and larger file. When you restart the server, it's going to bump the existing log file out and start a new one. If on the other hand, you create an entry that has a file statement and a size, but no versions, it's going to create a file up to the size you specify and anything more is going to be discarded even when you restart the server. So if you have a size of 100 meg, but you don't have a versions uh, statement, then you're going to write 100 meg of, of logging to that file. And at that point, you're going to get no more logging until you move that file and restart bind. So be aware of that. That's something that, that is rather uh, unexpected and uh, probably is a misconfiguration on, uh, on the administrator's part. So the next option here is null. And null is going to be used instead of the file statement. So in this case, null is going to say, take this, make this channel and just have it be a discard channel. So you can, you can change you know, whatever you want. You can create your very own null channel. The next three options here are the uh, ability of bind to log the information about this specific message that is being logged and put it into the log file. So if you remember, I showed you a list of categories. Well, if you're putting a lot of messages into a single uh, channel, then you don't necessarily, you know, it's kind of confusing as to which one is a query and which one is a database entry. So if you put print category as a yes or as a true, then it's going to, or bind is going to print the category name in the log message that's generated. 
In addition, you can print the severity. And this is going to be, you know, it's a, is it debugging? Is it informational? Is it critical? You know, there, there are different levels of severity, very similar to syslog, and it's going to print the severity in the log file as well. Also, the time. If you do not specify print time, it is going to just write the log data, but no timing information, which is okay, but not necessarily what we want. When would you not want to print time? Well, when you're logging to something that already generates a timestamp. So for example, if you're generating to, if you're writing it out to syslog, your syslog daemon is already going to put a timestamp on it. There's no reason to have two. So in the case of writing out to a syslog, print time would be no. All three of these, print category, severity, and time, are all defaulting to no. So if you want these printed, you do need to turn them on. And in the print time case, and this is something, again, that's new, uh, the ability to log to ISO 8601, 8601 UTC, local, and then Boolean is a yes or no, which actually is the same as turning local on if you say yes. This allows you to log the log messages in the ISO 8601 standard, or tell it that it doesn't matter what your local timestamp is, you want it logged to UTC, which I find very handy because a lot of uh, things that I do on the net, um, I have machines in multiple time zones. I don't wanna have to remember where a given machine is so having that log file generated in UTC, no matter what the local time zone is set for, is a very handy thing. So in this case, I could say print time to ISO 8601-UTC, and it's going to log with UTC. The severity is at what level do I want information logged? So again, this is very similar to syslog, where you have from you know, debug at your lowest level to critical at your highest level. And I think I probably should have had a list of the severities here, but you can find them in the, uh, the messages and you'll see some of them in the samples that I give here shortly. The severity lists the level at which you want logging and it will log that and everything above it. Everything that is more critical than whatever you're asking for will be logged. So by default, the severity is informational. Sever severity info is what is logged. You don't get the debugging information. You don't get errors. You don't, you get, don't get warnings. You don't get errors. You don't get criticals. Um, well, actually, I take that back. If you say info, you get everything above it. So you just don't get the debugging. You get info, you get warnings, you get errors, and you get critical. Syslog, again, is used in place of the file or null statements or uh, actually standard error. You see, we can write to standard error. Syslog allows us to write to the syslog. Um, in this case, it's instead of a file, instead of null, instead of standard error, we're writing out to syslog and we can write to a specific syslog facility. So if you're writing it out to local one or you're writing it out to daemon or you know, whatever, you can go in and have a different category than, uh, deba than, uh, than default underscore syslog also write to your syslog daemon. And again, the log facility can be, you know, help you uh, sorting things out. Um, so, uh, okay, and again, log severity is a set of levels. Uh, logging at the given level um, includes all of the levels below that level. So some samples. Yeah, that was that was pretty horrific looking at uh, at uh, at the, the 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 you know cut and paste from the the uh, administrator's reference manual. So let's look at some examples because that's the best way that I learn. And what you'll see here is that I'm using default logging, so I'm not really changing anything in the default. But in addition to that, what I want to do is I want to send DNS logging to a file called dnssec.log, and I'm going to put it into the var log bind directory. I'm going to keep five copies plus the active one, and each of them, them is going to be approximately 10 meg in size. And I want to record the time and severity to the log file. And since I'm logging this as dnssec into a dnssec log file, I don't necessarily need to log the category because I know it. I know from the name of the file what the uh, uh, 
the uh, category is. So I'm not worried about logging that. So what I'll do is I'll create a channel and I'm naming it DNSSEC underscore log. Inside these braces, I'm putting the file statement and I'm creating a slash var log bind DNSSEC.log. Since this begins with a slash, it is rooted in the file system. It does not add on the directory statement. But what this does, obviously, if you're in a change rooted environment, that slash var is in the change rooted environment, not in the local file system. So be aware of that. You'll notice that at the end of the file line, there is not a semicolon because the versions five and the size 10 meg are not separate standalone options, they are part of the file option. So the file is this file name. There are going to be five versions of it. So dnssec.log.0.1.2.3 and .4, in addition to dnssec.log, which is the currently being written one, and each of them is going to be 10 meg in size. We're going to turn a severity of debug level 10 why in the world do we want such a high debugging level? Well, that's because DNSSEC logging, for whatever reason, doesn't really start until debug level 10. Now, you can change this to debug level 5, debug level 2, debug level 99, and you're going to get additional information or less information. You're going to need to tune this to see exactly which bits you want. And again, we are going to put our own timestamp on this because logging to a file, there's nothing writing a timestamp except us. And the severity we do want, you know, is this a debug? Is this a warning? Is this a critical? We want that logged into the file as well. Now, once we've created this channel entry, you'll notice that we now close the brace and have a semicolon that closes the channel. Now, in our logging stanza, we're going to say the category DNSSEC, which again was created by the ISC engineers, is now being saved into the channel DNSSEC underscore log, which is the one that we created. DNSSEC is now not being sent anywhere else. It is only being sent to the DNSSEC log, which is going to be the DNSSEC.log file in the var log bind directory. So I think that's a, a very simple and obviously if you want to change, if you're looking for some other type of logging, you can go in and create your own channel. You can create your own, you know, you'll, you'll change the category name. So let's look at a different example. So now we want to start logging queries. So we're going to log all of the queries to a file called query.log. We're going to keep three copies plus the active one. And I see a mistake on my slide. I see versions five and copies three. So that's obviously incorrect. They're 10 meg each. The file will remain empty until we explicitly turn it on because again, by default, query logging is turned off unless you do an RNDC query log on or if you set the global option query log yes in your namedy.conf. So in our logging stanza, we're going to have a channel query underscore log, open brace. Then we have the file statement and we give it the location on disk where we want this log file stored. We say versions and obviously this should have been versions three, size 10 meg and the suffix is a timestamp. So now instead of dot zero, dot one and dot two, we're going to have dot and then the timestamp um, on those files. And in this case, obviously, we do want the time printed. We don't care about the severity because logging is always at info level. And we don't care about the category because we know that it's a query log. So we only want the time printed. Once we close off that channel definition, we now have the category statement that says that we want the queries all sent to the query log. So you'll notice that the format here where I have the file statement with the versions, the size, and the suffix all on one line is exactly the same as the previous slide where they were separated out onto individual lines. Again, file statement isn't ended until after the versions, the size, and the suffix. That's where we put our semicolon. Um, having taught the, uh, the DNS and bind class many, many, many times, it is a very common mistake to say file, double quote, whatever your file name, close quote, semicolon, versions three, semicolon, size 10 meg, semicolon, and that doesn't work. 
because bind doesn't know what a versions or size option are in the logging uh, configuration. So you have to be sure not to put those semicolons in place. So now I'm going to do something a little bit different and something that I mentioned earlier, but hadn't actually shown. So in this case, I'm going to log queries into two different channels and I'm going to log three different categories into a single channel and I'm going to have them dynamically logged. So in this case, I'm going to create two channels. You see, I have the channel query underscore log. Uh, the file is slash temp slash query dot log. You probably don't want to log into slash temp. There are just a number of bad things can happen, but I was doing some testing and it was just the easiest thing to do. Uh, in this case, I'm storing five versions. Then I create the channel of debug log. The file is slash temp debug dot log with a size of 100K. And I don't, I hope that the weed eater in the background isn't too annoying to you. It's pretty annoying to me. You'll notice in the debug log, I am printing the time, the severity, and the category because, as you'll see a little bit lower, I'm actually mixing in a number of different categories and I'm doing them at a number of different, or I'm, do, I, I'm possibly getting in messages that are a number of different severities, so I want to be able to see that information. Now, the interesting thing here is the fact that I have a severity of dynamic. A severity of dynamic logs info by default, so info and above, but it allows me to be able to turn on additional logging by using the debug level of bind itself. So if I start bind with a dash D and then a higher debug level, that debug level is used in this channel. Or if I do an RNDC trace and then a level, I can turn on logging and turn off logging by, you know, RNDC trace zero and have it log things only when I really want it to. So I can set this up in advance wait for whatever is going wrong, bump up my logging, bump up my debug level, it will automatically start logging, then I can turn it down and, you know, when, when the event is over or, you know, you know, I can, I can, you know, turn it on and off as I need. So once I have these two channels defined, I now take the three categories. So I have the category of queries and in this case, you'll notice inside the braces of the category definition, I have two different channel names. So what that means is that all of the queries are going to be logged into both query underscore log and debug underscore log. So query underscore log doesn't have the time or severity or category, and it only has five versions, which is kind of odd, but it's also sent to the debug log, and that one does have the time and the severity and the category printed. And what this allows us to do is interpret specific events by looking at the information and not having to look at two different log files and say, gee, you know, I'm looking at this. What was the next item that occurred? In this case, my debug log is going to contain the queries, the DNSSEC, and the client category with timestamps, with severity, and with the category, so I'm able to look at one file, this debug.log, and see very easily all three of the outputs of those categories, while still keeping my query log intact and having it do the right thing. Now, again, notice the little box over to the right side where it says possible error here. You probably want to specify both versions and size, and again, versions, without a size parameter is going to create a new log file every time bind is restarted. A size without a versions is going to generate a log file of that size and then forget everything else. So the 100k debug log is going to fill up really quickly and it's not going to roll over. So it's pretty useless. So in this case what you would probably want is size you know, a meg or two and versions, you know, five, and then you'll be able to go in and turn on the logging to the debug log, turn it off, look at the log messages that you have in place. So again, the severity of dynamic allows you to turn on and off logging at the debug levels as you wish. 
and the ability to separate or to, to split a single category into two channels, as is done with the queries, and also the ability to take multiple categories and send them to the same channel as the debug underscore log. These are very, very handy things that really aren't used as much as they probably should be. So deciphering the output, and my initial thought on this was, well, good luck. And of course, I'm just kidding, but only to an extent, because a lot of the debugging messages really aren't useful to the mere mortal. I look at these and I'm like, okay, yeah, I can go in and look at this and figure out, you know, where in the code this is being generated, but it really doesn't do me any good. So most of the logging is really for the engineering team, for the bind engineers, and they're going to be able to take this and really find, you know, use in it and where I don't. Uh, now there is one major exception as to where uh, logging is, uh, is, is easy or it's something that you as an administrator need to be able to do. And that is specifically query logging. So the query logging we're going to talk about in gory detail here. And the word, so the, the logging that you see here is without a timestamp and it's without the category and it's without the, uh, the, uh, the debug level or the, the level. This is only the, the information that would be generated basically from that, uh, the uh, definition of the channel that I had uh, just, just previous. So what you see outputted when you look at a query log is the word client followed by the at zero X and then a client object identifier. Now we've had questions in support. Oh, gee, you know, is that you know, is that something about the client? Well, it is, but it's only something to do with an internal object inside Bind. That is not something that you, as the administrator, are going to find useful or helpful. Uh, but the Bind engineers will see it and you know be able to reference that back to things in, for example, a core dump or in other log messages. Uh, the next thing on the line there you see is the IP address and a pound sign and the port number from which the query originated. So in this case, the query, most of the queries came from my internal 192.168.77.1. And then one of them came from the 77.131. And we can see that, uh, you know, we have, have the port numbers uh, from which these uh, were generated or where the queries were made. So this is the client address. This is something that's, that's useful for you as, a, uh, as an administrator. Um, the next thing is the IP address, oh, I'm sorry, the next thing in parentheses is the label that was queried for, followed by a colon, followed by the word query, followed by another colon. So if you are doing parsing of these messages, um, sometimes, so one of the things that was done was the addition of the client object identifier. So all of a sudden, everybody that was doing uh, log file analysis, suddenly it didn't, you know, their log files were, were unparsable. Well, and it's, it's easy for me to say this, you know, going looking back, but you know, if you had written your log parser so that it looked for the thing with the pound sign, you would have known the IP address and the port number. If you had looked for the things inside the parentheses, then you would have known that that was the label being queried for, but that's kind of, we shouldn't have really changed that object identifier. We shouldn't have changed the log file. Adding things to the end is probably better than adding them at the beginning. So the next thing is the query. Again, after the query colon, you're going to see the query again, but this time without parentheses. It is then followed by the class and the type of the query. So in this case, we see, uh, you know, the IN, uh, quad A, uh, INSRV, so we were looking for server records, we were looking for quad A records, we're looking for address records, and um, then we see a, a flag. So the plus is actually a flag. It's not, just, it's not just marking the fact that there's something there. It is either, and we'll see if you notice down there, if the recursion desired or RD flag was set, then there is a plus. If it is a minus, then the RD flag was not set. So there is either going to be a plus or a minus in that uh, flags field. It may be the only thing, as you see in most of these uh, examples. So I was asking, I was looking at the log files on a recursive server. All of the queries that were coming in were recursive, so you notice that they all had the plus sign on them. 
if the uh, request was signed uh, using um, a TSIG, then there's going to be an uppercase S. If EDNS was in use, the EDNS flag and the version number are going to be there. So there's an uppercase E and then in parentheses, the version number. So you see the last one there is a plus E open print zero close print. So we know that EDNS zero was in effect for that query that was made. Um, if this query came in over TCP, we have an uppercase T. If the DNSSEC OK was, bit was set, we have an uppercase D. If the checking disabled bit was set, we have an uppercase C. If you don't know what these messages mean, then it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, a documentation out there. Um, I probably will go into this in a, uh, in a different uh, webinar. We'll, we'll go into some of the uh, more esoteric uh, uh, messages that are sent. Um, and for example, if a valid DNS server cookie was received, you're going to have an uppercase V. And if a DNS cookie option without a valid server cookie was present, you're going to have an uppercase K. So in this case, the only one that was really interesting that was uh, above just a recursive query was the last one where somebody did a query for the label allen.cleg.com and it was done with EDNS zero. It was done with the DNSSEC okay. So somebody was looking at for, for the, uh, uh, the DNSSEC uh, for the uh, signatures and it was, there was a, a DNS cookie option, but it did not have a valid server cookie with it. So you can look at these and you can, you can figure out a lot of things from the messages that are provided. Now, the next thing, and there's actually a, a, a mistake here, and I apologize. The thing in the parentheses there is not the address to which the response is sent. It's the address from which the response is sent. So in this case, you'll see that they're all the dot one address. That is the server. That is my name server, 192.168.77.1. And that is the interface on that server from which the query was sent. And something new, if there is a client subnet option, if you're running with, uh, with the uh, ECS code, then you're going to have possibly another option at the end of the, uh, the query message that is the client subnet. Um, it's going to be in square brackets. It's going to have a bracket ECS and then the address slash source slash scope. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to do a presentation about ECS and uh, we'll go into that in additional detail at that point as well. So what about DNS tap? That's logging too, right? Well, DNS tap is, and this is a quote from uh, the DNS tap.info website. It's a flexible structured binary log format for DNS software. It uses protocol buffers to encode events that occur inside DNS software in an implementation neutral format. That sounds like something that I could talk about for one or more hours. So you know what? I'm going to. There's going to be a future presentation on DNS tap. Now, if you're interested in DNS tap right off the bat, if you want to go out there and look at it right now, there is a KB article in the ISC uh, knowledge base. So kb.isc.org slash docs slash AA-01342. And uh, I think uh, Vicki is going to be making these slides available shortly uh, after the presentation. So you'll be able to uh, find this and, and go out and, uh, and uh, you know, look at that if you're interested in DNS tap. So a couple of things that you need to be careful of with logging. And it's not really that um, it's going to break anything necessarily. Well, one of these will. But most of it's just making sure that you know where the files are actually being put. The first thing, obviously, logging respects the directory option. So if your file statement don't have a leading slash, then it's going to be put into the directory specified by your directory statement. If you are running change rooted, the logs will reside in the change root directory. High debug levels are going to cause headaches. For one thing, it's going to cause huge output and rapidly moving files. So, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, a, a, you know, 100K uh, log file, because usually there's not much being put into it, and you keep five versions, you turn on debugging, all of a sudden, it's going to be running through those files and it's going to be hard to actually find anything useful. Um, now, this is the most dangerous thing and it's something that I saw 
uh, which kind of surprised me a little bit because I'll tell you honestly, I don't go into debugging uh, messages very often, specifically this one. Um, it will format some of the output in the log file differently, which may very well break things that are parsing the log file. And I'll show you this on the next slide. So be aware of this. When you turn log levels above 10, you may end up with things in your log file that are not of the format that your parsers are expecting. So things, bad things may occur, I will warn you. Now, the biggest warning I can give you is that bind may become slow in query processing due to being busy doing logging. If you are doing logging of queries, it's going to you know, chew up CPU, it's gonna chew up disk IO, and it's going to slow bind down. Now I'm gonna give you that sample of a, a breaking of uh, the, the uh, log parsers. So in this case, you'll notice that the first entry is a database uh, debug level five. The second one is a database debug level five. The next one, the 29 October 2019 at 2034.50 resolver, debug level 10, received a packet from this IPv6 address and this port number, and then in the log file is the packet. So unless you're, you know, if you're parsing something and you're expecting the third uh, item or the third thing on the line to be the name of the category that you're logging to, all of a sudden you're gonna get a category called opcode, and then you're gonna get one called QR, and all of a sudden you're logging and everything that you're doing is going to go absolutely haywire. So be very careful when you start turning up logging that you know, you know what it's going to look like before you actually do it so that if you're doing parsing, you know, if you're, if you're keeping track of things based on logs and suddenly your logging doesn't work anymore, somebody's gonna, uh, somebody's gonna have a fit. And I don't like to be the one that causes that problem. So in closing, let me give you a couple of additional resources. The first being the ISC knowledge base. There is a file, there's a, a knowledge base entry there called bind logging, some basic recommendations. It goes into some of the things I've talked about here in this presentation. You can find it at the link there, docs uh, AA0152526. Uh, and then another uh, place that, another fantastic resource is the Zytrax uh, website. And there is a fantastic little section on the DNS bind nine logging clause. Uh, you can find it there at the link. Uh, it is a little bit outdated. Uh, it does not show uh, some of the options that actually I talked about in here, but it will get you going uh, with basically any version of bind. Um, it just doesn't have the, the most bleeding edge uh, options. So with that, I am going to stop my screen sharing and uh, take a look and see and uh, let, let keep, your screen, keep your screen sharing up, Alan, and go back to slide 14. Okay, I will have to restart my sharing and go back. You said slide 14? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hold on, I gotta figure out how to, I'm gonna slide 14, 17, 16, 15, 14, yes. All right, so it, I don't know, it doesn't necessarily have to be 14. I think you've got it on 13 and 15 as well. But uh, in the questions, uh, oh, there are a bunch of questions about that um, client object identifier. Apparently that is a mystifying to everybody. So, um, so, so there's three specific questions. One is, you know, why do I sometimes have that? Why do I have that in some of the logs and not in others? Another question is, um, will that object identifier be unique to each client? And then uh, the last question was, uh, do you happen to know what version of bind that uh, client object identifier was introduced in? So basically, okay, let me, anything let me more take those in, <laughs> Let me take those in order. The first one, why do you see it in some logs and not in others? I have no idea. You should be seeing it in all of your logging. Um, it should appear um, anytime you're doing query logging, it should be in there. Now, what I would think that you may be seeing is if you're running two different uh, servers, you know, two different systems, maybe one of them is older and it didn't have 
the client identifier in it. And that would be my guess as to, to what would, uh, would be occurring. The second question is, is this client identifier going to be unique to a specific client? I think it is actually going to be more specific than that because it is actually um, not only the client itself, but it is also the specific query. So if you're trying to chase a specific query through bind, that is the piece that is going to link all of these things together. So the, the client uh, identifier is going to be something that's going to be able to be used to you know, chase a specific query through all of its, its path through, uh, through the bind uh, uh, query logging and in, the, uh, in debugging of the binary or in a, like a, a core dump. Um, as to when it appeared, I don't know. Um, it is relatively new, um, but it's not, I, I don't know. Sorry, um, we, can, we can find it and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to look that up. And I'm sure that, I'm sure it's, it's quite, well, uh, quite well documented wherever it is. Look in the release notes uh, for, for Bind, uh, look in the changes log. And uh, I'm sure that if you do a search in the changes log for client object identifier, you're gonna find it. Okay, um, we have a comment um, from Eugene. Um, apparently the default, uh, by default, the buffer parameter and the login category is set to false. So the log messages are flushed and you have to set it to true if you want them not to be flushed. So that was uh, back when you were talking yep. about the defaults, you weren't sure about that. Yep, and fantastic. Just, uh, Thank you, Eugene, I appreciate that. Contributed that answer. Um, someone asked, Venkata asked if you could go back to the category list slide. My guess is uh, there's going to be a question coming up about the categories. So we'll just uh, let that show for a minute while somebody's thinking of the question. Um, is, here's another question. Um, is there a way for buying to log the DNS answers uh, to a log file? Not at this point. Now that is something that DNS tap will allow you to do. Um, and also, if you do um, logging on a uh, side by side with bind, I would actually recommend instead of instead of having bind do all of the logging, I would recommend firing up a separate process that actually is looking at the traffic on port 53. Uh, because in that way, you don't, you know, your bind is busy doing queries and, you know, handling queries, sending responses and doing all the work that it has to do there. It's very nice to have some of that offloaded so that you know, while it's doing all the work, you can have something else that's just doing you know, query, query and response maintenance. Okay, uh, there's another question. Somebody asks me what the spill category is, I really don't have any idea. <laughs> um, there is another question about, um, uh, let's see, um, do you have any recommendations or are there any KBR calls as far as you know for optimizing logging to syslog-ng? Well, personally, I don't like logging to syslog. And that's, it, it's a long-term dislike of mine because I don't like sending log messages across a, uh, a, a non-guaranteed transport. And if you're doing syslog output, you know, it may be it may be perfect. It may work just fine, but a lot of times your syslog output ends up going over UDP, and when you know it it goes somewhere, it gets dropped. Syslog has its own mechanisms of, you know, gee, this was too noisy, so I dropped X number of queries or X number of messages. Um, I don't know of anything right off the bat that specifies or that that gives any optimizations for that, but I personally I don't like logging to syslog. But again, that's old school. Um, I, I'm really not, to, to show you how old school it is, syslog ng is, you know, next generation or new generation. I really haven't done much with syslog ng. So, you know, and it's been around for years and years. So I apologize, I'm not probably uh, uh, not qualified at this moment to give an answer. But, you know, it's something that we could look into definitely. So there's a comment from uh, Robert Harold that says, if you are logging to syslog, you should use TCP to avoid dropping packets. Yes, and of course, if you're logging using TCP, you're doing three-way handshakes. And if you're doing three-way handshakes, you're doing lots of network traffic. And if you're logging queries, 
that way, you've just basically, your, uh, your system is uh, way too busy doing, you know, logging to do anything useful. So be, just be aware of that. Logging queries, especially to something like syslog, especially over TCP, is gonna be, is gonna be pretty ugly. So Venkata, you have your hand up. I think I have enabled you to talk. If you just unmute, you should be able to ask your question. Venkata? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, I see uh, Venkata actually asked, asked it in the Q&A and I can see it. And of course, the question is, what is the spill category? And you know what? I don't know. Um, it, is, it is documented in the ARM. Uh, I know that it is because I literally uh, took this list uh, from the newest version of the ARM and copy and pasted and reformatted. So I know that it's, it's documented in there and I did read it. Uh, my memory is just not good enough to actually remember what it was. So. All right, so um, I, I don't need to, are you looking at the questions in the chat? Uh, not in the chat, I'm looking at the ones in the q and A. I can actually see the questions and answers, but not the chat very easily. All right, um, so then I'll, I'll just uh, continue reading them. So the, the question about syslog ng was syslog ng at the local name servers disk. That was a clarification. Um, Another question from Sammy, um, how many requests per second can bind handle with query logging enabled on standard hardware? And, and probably really the question is, you know, can you give any rough rule of thumb for, uh, you know, how it might impact your performance? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that you're gonna lose about 30% of your query logging capability or your querying or your, yeah, your response capability um, if you are um, doing query logging. So it's, it's a big hit. And of course, I don't know what standard hardware is, so I can't give you a, a number, but take whatever you're doing at your max and then subtract off a third and that's what you're gonna get. And I see uh, Jimmy Lang has posted the, uh, the uh, spill is the uh, logging of queries that have been terminated either by dropping or responding with serve fail as a result of fetch limit quota being exceeded. Thank you very much for that answer. And yes, I remember that being the answer, but I don't, you know, I, it's, it's a new category and uh, I've, never, I've never seen anybody turn it on at this point. Okay, so there was a, a, a comment. Um, let's see, when you look at the, the um, here we go, we're getting it in both sides. So during the discussion on the symbols and the logs, the plus, the E, so on and so forth, maybe you can go back to that slide. Yep. So there was some uh, uh, chatter uh, about um, uh, what does the yeah. T, what does the yeah, T, T is not TSIG, T is for TP, S is for TSIG. So signed, uh, TSIG is signing and signed is an uppercase S. And so what's T again? T is TCP. Okay. All right. I think that was a little confusing. Let's see. Um, has there been a benchmark on the impact of logging on performance? I think, you know, that again, it's a, uh, the problem with benchmarking is everything is, is really dependent on the hardware and software you're running. Um, you know, if there really was a standard machine that would really help, um, but there is no such thing. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions. So I think we're done with the questions. Okay. Um, uh, the recording, I believe, does actually include the uh, questions and answers that are logged in the, uh, in the interface. So somebody asked if we would include them, and I think they're included automatically. And um, it takes a you know an hour or so for uh, to uh, reformat the recording and post it, but uh, you know it'll be up you know in a day or two. Yeah. So I think we're done, Ellen. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, so the reason that we actually uh, had a, a webinar on this was because 
the KB article on logging is actually the most popular article in our knowledge base. So it is astonishing to me how, uh, how much interest there is in logging, but now I see it's a pretty complicated subject. <laughs> So thank you, Alan. I think we're done. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Yep. Thank you. And uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. And go out there and create good log files. And uh, we'll, you know, uh, we're available on social media. You know, we're we're, um, you know, we we've got uh, we've got the tweeters and we've got the Facebook and we've got all that stuff. So feel free to uh, to find us and and uh, figure out what it is we're doing. Have a great day.